We're very excited today to have with us Mr. Keith Bloom of L4 Studios, who brought to the world the game Lords of Baseball. This is one of the limited edition rare charter owner versions from the Kickstarter campaign, a game developed by Max Gemelli based on his father's idea, and L4 Studios has brought it to the world. You were just at Origins in Columbus, Ohio. Now, as you might imagine, Mr. Bloom has an extensive gaming history. He worked for other companies, including Eagle Griffin, which, of course, produces the great baseball highlights and football highlights of Mike Fitzgerald. And with L4 Studios, he now consults with game makers on all facets of getting games to market, from development and manufacturing to the all-important finances and logistics. Keith has degrees in electrical engineering and business administration. His gaming history actually goes back to the late 70s when his uncle Brian came down for a visit from Wisconsin and showed a little game that his company was producing or selling called Dungeons and Dragons. That had to be a fairly significant moment in your life. Yeah, in hindsight, it was definitely something that was an inflection point for sure. Yeah, it turns out I was talking to one of my friends about that because when we played, I had some friends come over. It turns out we were playing um, one of the modules for one of the early Gen Cons. At the end of it, we, we never made it to the end. It was one where you you weren't going to succeed. <laughs> That's a little more common back in the day. Uh, and if I recall correctly, at the end, you were going to see Orcus. It was a rough module. But... Uh, yeah, that set the stage. It opened the door because it wasn't when my uncle would visit because we were in Indianapolis at the time. So a, a relatively short drive uh, from Lake Geneva. I got to play a uh, cosmic encounter, um, things in that vein. And actually it was with my uncle. He showed me Liar's Dice. And actually I pu currently publish Liar's Dice. I met Richard Borg over time and that's one of my favorite games. And so it kind of came full circle and that my uncle introduced me to that and I and my family just have absolutely loved that game. And so when I got the chance to publish, I was like, oh, heck yes, that's happening. And speaking of tying it to Lords of Baseball, uh, you'll see in the, in the star player cards, people who opted to back at a certain level and appear on those cards. And in addition to my son who played baseball in high school, he's now in undergrad, um, I took with my aunt's permission, it was my uh, uncle Brian's passed away, his image from Boot Hill. And it's on one of the star player cards. So if you if you recognize where he's with he has the pistols like this, but his his likeness his face is on one of the cards so because he loved baseball as well he's a huge fan of baseball so. now sports games of course are a small segment of the larger gaming industry uh you were just at origins showing off lords of baseball what was kind of the level of interest i was thrilled with the feedback on multiple fronts my logistics guy and if you look on the the game on the retail level, you'll see Mr. B Games is on there. He handles the logistics side. Mr. B and Mayfair rented a pod, and I also rented, but I, I like work under that umbrella. So L4 Studios is a studio. And then, for example, if retail shops or distributors are interested in my product, they're going to get it through Mr. B. So we had a pod, so we weren't in the main hall, we had a pod that was off to the side, and that we like those a lot because it's we're able to sit and speak in a conversational tone, people can come in, sit down, have water, so we, we love our pod. Almost nonstop, probably 70 to 80% of the time, was playing a game of Lords of Baseball. The response was amazing, and what I heard, because you were mentioning the idea of a sports game I feel like we have a foot planted in both worlds. And as a result, I'm starting to think that we may be on to something bigger than I expected here. And I try to temper my results. I'm a small publisher. I like what I do. But the feedback and the, the ratings that we're seeing suggest that we, we may have uh, something really special going on here. And the reason why 
is a little bit what you were asking, and that is with the baseball theme, it does engage a lot of people for that reason. The game is set in the 19-teens. So as you mentioned, you have the franchise bundle, right? You are uh, a franchise owner. So it's about the business of baseball, not a baseball game simulation. And so when somebody prepares to sit down to the table, that's one of the first things I tell them because there are people, right? There are games out there for that, et cetera. That doesn't put people off, right? The allure of actually managing your franchise, I think, is something that actually, if somebody likes baseball, saying, oh, this is more, it, yes, there you will, you do construct your team, but you're doing everything. You're building out the stadium. You're managing your finance. That doesn't scare people away. Now, here's where the other side of it comes in, and this is the thing I heard extensively at Origins, and that is people would sit down. It was often um, either groups uh, of you know uh, player groups three or four or couples right and and inevitably one of them would say i don't really like baseball or i didn't think i was going to like this but i would say and i realize it's kind of a self selection thing right people aren't going to say i hate this game <laughs> usually but i feel like 85 to 90% of the people were like i didn't think I was going to enjoy this, but I really like it a lot. It looks like when you set out all the components, the game looks intimidating. There's a board that has numbers on it. There are six or seven stacks of cards. You have two player mats. You have stacks of tiles. One of my friends who did a preview video for it was like, oh, it's kind of spreadsheety. And I heard that word from a different person at had origins and I said I said, well it okay fair you know because kind of, they kind of you look at you look at the uh, you look at your player board and it basically is it's an old style uh scoreboard well that looks like a spreadsheet so it's like okay fair but what one of the people who mentioned at the show and I thought she summed it up so well is that Because the game occurs in phases, so each major turn is a year, but then within the year, you have the phases you would expect of baseball. You have spring training, regular season, finances, then hot stove. What happens is while on, you know, at first blush, there's this large amount of stuff for you. In the moment of the game, when you're doing something, you have three to five cards in your hand, and it's you. You're executing this. You're not worried about what somebody else is doing, uh, you know, 98% of the time. You're not worried about what somebody else is doing, unless it's regular season. But all these things, you get to focus on what that is. So it becomes very modular in that sense. And as a result, you don't have this overwhelming sense of analysis paralysis where it's like, I've got so many things going on. So the game, while there's a lot of stuff there, you can get into it. As I'm walking somebody through the game, what I just mentioned to you, I present as the summary. Year turn, these phases, here's your franchise card. Let's get the characteristics of your franchise on the board. Okay, now we have spring training. Let's talk about spring training. This is where you're primarily focusing on the makeup of your team. Regulars go to stars and by some da 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 And so you can then start to see these pieces. And then when you get into that next year, you're like, yeah, I understand the flow of this. I see how it all ties together. We sold out on Sunday. We'll have it at Gen Con. Richard Launius has worked on an expansion for the star players where they have nicknames and little abilities. And we played several games with that. He was a backer of the game as well. And I I got to work with him back when, uh, when I was at Eagle and did uh, defenders of the realm with him. And that was so much fun. The the first iteration, all signs suggest that we're going to get a a Kickstarter up for the expansion and all signs at this snapshot in time suggest we're going to need to go to a reprint. I reserve the right to change my mind, <laughs> but if, if the trends continue. There's one thing I want to go back because you mentioned it was designed by Max and his dad. Very true. 
Uh, many years of development work were done by Jeff and Carla at Lab H, uh, Laboratory H. They are also uh, from the Columbus area. So I wanted to acknowledge them as well because they did. I came in. The reality is, and in, in, in you hit the nail on the head, I, I'm on the publisher side of things, right? So I deal with the factories and um, coordinating work with like the graphic artists, sometimes the artists, et cetera. So I came in literally pivoting to a football analogy, right? Just to get it across the, the goal. Line. I had known of the game because of the times I would go to Origins and it was played in prototype form and was very excited to be involved, but recognizing I'm late to the party, but, uh, but played a role in it anyway. And what would be your take on kind of the state of gaming today? It's an embarrassment of riches. People who like to play games, if you can't find something that scratches your itch, you're not looking or you don't know where to look, right? It's a, it's a wonderful time in that capacity. One of the challenges and why I was, have been very pleased about Lords of Baseball, a byproduct of there being an embarrassment of riches is the other side of it. And that is you can have a really good game, but if you don't have a few things break your way, if you don't have a strong advertising presence or an advocate that is an influencer in the industry, it may not do well. I uh, started with Eagle, the Glenn Drover iteration in 2003. At that point in time, I think Essen would see, I want to say probably 30 to 50 major releases each year. And it might have been less. And now, I don't even know. I feel like 10 years ago, I heard it was like a thousand. And I have to only guess it's going up. That's at Essen. That's not the rest of the year. So, you know, there's this circumstance where it's just, so many games are coming out. So to try and elevate above the, you know, the natural white noise that is the floor is, is its own challenge. You know, we come at it from the statistics based gaming side. So going back to APA 1951, national pastime in 1930, Stratomatic, Status Pro. You know, we talk a lot about, geez, here's this Euro game aspect and here are these other games We've got all these fans of games and these fans of sports, but there's just this, this lack of connection. I wonder if a game like Lords of Baseball, which is essentially a Euro game, you're going around accumulating points. We'll see the board here. But is there any way to kind of maybe merge the two or you think they're just so disparate that never the twain shall meet? In the U.S., I don't think it's hyperbole to say this could be the game because you are talking about these two camps, Right. The, the idea of, okay, you have, you know, baseball is, and I do feel it's, it's still the case, is, you know, the national pastime. It's a small sample size, speaking of, you know, statistics back here. But I do believe that the look of this game, I, I know that when people were talking about it with the idea that it's, and you'll see it, and you have seen it in yours, right? It's like, it's not an accident that, that the deluxe box is made out of wood or that the, the, the actual, um, you know, base package also looks like a cigar box, right? The, the baseball cards were stored in those that came in cigarette and cigar, uh, you know, packs and such. I think this is a case that it does feel like that we did hit the right presentation for it. This weathered style people are liking, right? It captures that era. So that's inviting. Um, the second thing then is the, the topic is one that when we were running the Kickstarter and when I was playing at Origins and when I played with other people, it is something that you would regularly hear the players talking about memories with their father or grandfather, family as a whole. That was always fun. That was the thing that, you know, I, I do several things as far as like jobs. I do the publishing because I enjoy it. It reminds me of why I do this when I hear people talk about times with family or I see parents and their children 
and they come up and they are having fun and they're talking about playing a game together and you see somebody who's happy and it's, I'm like, this is why I do this, right? I mean, it, that is it. That is it. And so when this game then evokes those memories, that to me is something where it's accomplishing, you know, what I always hope to be is my underlying goal when I do games. Um, and then also people remember their, you know, investment in a team, right? That that's also part of the fun. And where we did that, the, the game uses the historic cities and the names of the fields, which is legal. Most people recognize you can't use the likenesses or images of the current teams and things like that. But when you're referring to something historical and why the Stratomatics and the older teams could do it, and my guess is you are intimately familiar with this. Statistics are public knowledge. So you, you can look up Ty Cobb's lifetime statistics every year, et cetera. So that information is not protected. It's the likeness, potentially the name tied to, right? That's where you get into the question. So when we have a city and a name of an old field that is no longer in existence, that's, we can do that. That was part of the fun is researching because within the game, part of what you do is build out your stadium. So, you know, what would ultimately become Old Comiskey? And we didn't call it Wrigley, obviously, right? That's an example of one we, you wouldn't do. That's where I think the bridge can occur is when you have a game that has a theme that naturally engages people and then almost as if you're luring them in in such a way that it's well it's not just you're not just you know rolling dice for the batter and the pitcher and getting this it's actually a bigger you know layer above that but then when it is presented in such a way that you're making these like i said where where i call the modular right, with manageable decisions so that somebody who's not used to that side of the gaming world can get that type of exposure. I, I think that actually does have some potential. And I would argue I'm going to find out at Gen Con because the advantage to being at Origins with the product and showing a lot of people and talking through is I realized it's like practice for anything. This is the first show I've been at this year with the product anyway. And so it allows me to think about what's working with people, what isn't. If somebody comes up and wants an introduction, how am I going to show it? So, for example, also because Boost Space is, you know, like real estate in downtown New York, right? it's like you, you kind of, there are other people displaying as well. So I'm basically going to have a few cards, right? And a portion of it, it's, you know, pieces out so that I can basically talk people through without having everything spread out, which would probably scare away most people. But I think I can have the slice of Americana. And games like this, I mean, the, one of the hallmarks of Euro-style games and today's games is that they're so massively crafted, detailed, aesthetic, beautiful. Uh, the components are so well-made. I mean, they have to be. These are collector's items in addition to experiences. And I want to give a shout out actually for folks who might come across this who aren't statistics-based gamers. You know, Keith Avalone, Sam Avalone, and Play Games, they've really embraced that concept of adding new aesthetic and adding color, colorful cards or breakaway football, Arthur Franz and his group, where it's a kind of very colorful uh, or World Cup by Mark Bates. Uh, resurrection of the game by another designer you know you're starting to see more sports games kind of straddle that line and it's coming together and of course you don't want to overload euro mechanics with you know maybe a little statistical component but maybe at some point there's sure. a way to do a high level a win-loss thing or something like that as we start to pull this out here i want to just start looking at right off the top here is the uh punch board so what do we expect in this? That is going to be where you will have things like the retirement tokens, the media tokens, and the stadium tiles. So you're actually, you know, part of the game is you're, you can add concessions, you can add bleachers, you're trading players, you're retiring players. You have the super deluxe version in the wooden box. So your game can hold the, you can take 16 people. 
So this is just some of the um, uh, components here, and there's a lot. I mean, yeah, so that one you have up is an example. Those are, So each, uh, the stadium has four characteristics that can be upgraded. The yellow is the, is the media, green is your field, and then you have the concessions in red and the bleachers in blue. And so over the course of the game, you will be building out your stadium. People who are familiar with brass or the, the mechanics of brass, where you have stacks of tiles and you're working down the stack to get to the better upgrades and higher ability levels, um, it has that, that feel to it. So you actually have four stacks, right? One of each of those upgrade types. I feel like the game captures the nature of the era without having cumbersome rules. And a good example of that is when you upgrade your field to a level two, you get an additional team quality. And the team quality is a reflection. It's, it is what it sounds like. It's a reflection of how good the team is. And during this era, so why the teams were a big deal is the game started to morph into the product as we know it today. So there were a lot of things that started to come in place. It is when a lot of the, the concrete palaces started to come online as well. The architecture made its, its turn during this era where a lot of the bigger uh, constructions were going up. In this era, for example, if you had if you had a fast team, you knew you know good base runners were coming to play you. They do stuff like water down the base path, or if a team was a good hitting team, they'd let the grass grow so that the balls would die. You know they could play in and the balls would die faster. So the idea of as you improve your state, you know, improve your stadium. It makes sense that that would have a direct reflection in how well your team performs. It's that kind of improvement that's happened. I like that there are mechanics within the game that are just, they capture the story without having to kind of be this, well, and then you'll do this or whatever. It's like, nope, you build that, you get that, bang, and it's captured. In the world of stats games, you know, APA has stadium effects. A lot of folks, uh, a lot of games play has, um, a lot of games have the weather effects, the momentum, trying to capture momentum in the stats-based game. Uh, I mentioned breakaway football. He really captures kind of uh, specific team attributes and things like that. There's always that kind of, do the stats alone tell the story? And they kind of do, and you let the story play out. Or, you know, you also incorporate mechanics down to the blades of grass or maybe turf style in a football game something like that wind right lights and things like that i'm going to try to get this bad boy out of here oh my goodness i don't know oh, oh. here we go and yeah and to your point that's why there are dice rolls that are involved and they don't they play a role but they're part of a bigger picture right the team qualities they do get into the teens and low 20s and you are typically rolling a six-sided die. You may have a second one, but it's not additive. You have a third, that's rare. Your point about statistics and the nature of a, because when you play the regular season, you have one engagement with another team. You roll dice, you, you play a card, you roll dice, and that may, that will capture the 22 game series for that season. It is something when you think about baseball and the nature of statistics and team play and such, it's, you know, on any given night, any given day, a team can win. So I, I think without it become becoming overly prescribed, you get the logical variance that is across a baseball season. You mentioned that there is an expansion coming up. I wonder, you know, there's the history of Negro leagues, Latin American leagues, Japanese leagues. There's a lot of opportunity to kind of bolt on some cool stuff here. Yeah, the current one focuses, and we're looking at a few things, but the one that is already in circulation is the star players. Um, Richard looked up the name history. Somebody, oh shoot, and his name's escaping me, but he's been working on a solo version uh, called Dead Ball or Dead Ball Era. 
Yeah, we've asked we've been asked about the Negro League a lot, and that is something that I would like to do. I think that opens the door to would you then be do, doing different player mats because then I expect you're going to be in different locations and such. So it's a question of at what level do you do you basically take it and create a new game with it, or is it a circumstance where it's like, well, we're, we're still going to use the Chicago board, but we'll have different cards or whatever. So there absolutely has been an expressed interest in that, and I do think it's a tremendous era that is – slowly starting to get the attention it deserves more so now than maybe 15 or 20 years ago, but maybe not at the level that it should be. That's a a robust part of the baseball history that I think could absolutely benefit from a further uh, telling. We want to make sure that we do justice to that. We've also been asked, does it make sense to explore doing it for football? There are a number of people who at Origins were kind of asking for that as well. So again, it's early in the process because we just fulfilled the Kickstarter campaign, but because it's, you know, just been released, you know, want to give it a little bit of time. And when I say little bit, right, that certainly the first exposure that I get to see at Origins has been tremendous. And then Gen Con's coming up in no time at all. The reviews are starting to come in on BGG. I've been very happy with those. So I think there is, like I said, early signs all indicate that the idea of expansions is something that makes sense. I think the way to kind of summarize that is like very excited to support games that do well, right, with expansions. And I think this is a game that naturally has it because when you have the game come out and there are a lot of pieces to it that are very, it works together extremely well. Um, people were talking about the idea of having abilities with the star players in during the Kickstarter campaign. One of the things that um, can create missteps in a camp in any campaign is creating these expansions, but them not running through the testing process the way the rest of the game was. And so that that's a great way to to stumble. Right. Because then the player experience, even if it's an expansion, but if they want to play with it immediately and it damages the rest of the game in this day and age, if you know, if a game doesn't play well out of the gate, it may never see the table again because there's another 50 behind it. We just knew ahead of time. It's like we can do we can do stretch rewards that like we went to when you see the the master boards where you're tracking the characteristics of your team and your finances, front office, et cetera, that's actually a triple layer board. The stadiums and the and the tracker boards are, are two-sided in the sense that you have the Federal League on one side and the Continental on the other, and both sides are weld with the fact that you've got cubes on there keeping track of stuff when the board was purely just flat, right? The inevitable bump or a die roll coming in, basically then you were scattering the characteristics of your team. And so, you know, the wells were an example of, a, and we wanted it to be an early stretch reward because we knew it was a big deal. That doesn't affect gameplay in the sense of actually on the mechanical sense, it's more on the execution of the, yeah, it makes it easier because now you've got these wells to hold the cubes in place. So about how long does it take to play a game of Lords of Baseball? It's about 30 to 45 minutes per player is typically what we see. Depends on number of seasons. So if you play a three-season game with four players, I would expect in the first sitting that that's going to be probably two to two and a half hours, maybe three if you've got a social table. Once you get used to it in – Spring training in hot stove and the finances, you can handle those on your own in almost all cases. Star players do become a finite resource. So as you get a little bit further into the game, when you are taking star players from the pool, you then may have to explore doing that sequentially. But that's the exception. The rest of it is, oh, I'm doing a call up. My regulars becoming a star. That's an internal event. So I don't need to worry about other people. 
Um, if I'm bringing in some prospects and paying some money for them, I can handle that on my board. I don't, the, the money is tracked on the board. I like the idea of pushing the theme to the weathered stuff. And then I think my claim to fame in this game was basically saying, I want to track the money on the board because we were exploring having money. And I was like, if you can do that on the board, it was all about cutting time. Right. There's not value add to making change and doing X, Y, and Z. So if I made any contribution to the game, those would probably be the two, <laughs> which are minor. And again, but. this is the, I think, one of 50. I'm going to try to get this up here. Mr. Nice. Yeah, there, yeah, there's Mr. B's logo on the lower left. Yeah, that's and mine's on the lower right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So this we just had to just wanted this one for our archives for sure. It just seemed too good to uh Pass up here, and here are all your components. A lot of dice, a lot of... They're cubes and discs. What you're looking at, that game will actually play 16 people. And so you are looking at what amounts to two base games. The base game will play up to four. And then we have two two-player expansions. So with a base game and the two two-player expansions, yep, we got two rule books with it as well. In your version, you also have a second set of colors. So you have 16 different colors. Now, this is something, too, that, that your, your listeners, if they know about the game, they may be aware of. If not, I, I want them to be aware of it because there, there's discussion about it. But I, I was clear, and I maintain my position. Um, and that is that the coloring on the discs, the coloring on the cubes really don't matter because they're the ones in front of you. Where there's a little bit of question is some of the disc, and as you see it, you'll be able to tell some of the colors are similar. So when you're looking at the, the three discs on the board, sometimes they are close together. And now already some uh, people have created some stickers you could put on them. If you don't care about that, you could also take a marker and put a line on it, which that's a personal choice, or you could repaint them. There is a question of should we go with colors that are more primary, right, to create this separation, et cetera. And I just said, listen, I'm not going to do this. Like the whole idea of this game is to create components that, that do the sense of immersion and nothing is going to pull you out of that other than a shocking yellow and, you know, a neon red. And what does that mean? Well, I looked at the historical colors of the teams of the era for those particular locations. And usually there were two. And I would try to use them to get as much separation as possible. Not surprisingly, right, reds, blues, grays, blacks are prominent and so there are some colors that are closer together that is what it is so if one chooses and it's just like it's too much of a hassle i want to do this like that's fine but so by way of with the set you have you actually have 16 colors it's one of the uh you see yes that is uh that right that's an example of the two-sided with the wells yeah so working from left to right the star players are represented by actual cards. So that's where that little cutout looking space is on the left edge. That's where you can set those for your reference. Your regulars are that next, um, basically, you know, the vertically oriented rectangle there. For every three regulars you have, that increases your team quality by one. So the, the baseballs, on this master board are representative of a level of your team. And then to the right of the star players up at the top, there are your prospects. You see for every five of those, there is a home plate. That's actually a victory point that you get when it comes time for finances and VPs. In the upper right, that's where you have your farm system team manager and front office. The farm system plays its role during spring training. The team manager plays his or her role during the, the, each level of the team manager contributes to the team quality. 
And then the front office is front and center during the hot stove era. In the middle of the board where it says TQ, that is short for team quality. That's what TQ is how it's referred to in, in the uh, rule book. So that's where you will know. You will always be able to calculate your team quality based on your regulars, your stars, your team manager, and then if you have uh, field upgrades, that's where uh, you'll be able to do that. And then in the lower right, there is the TQ difference. That's where you identify how many games you win in a particular series. So the way a series is resolved, you have your team quality, your opponent's team quality, you each roll a die, add the die to the team quality, and the delta basically will tell you your, uh, your record for that engagement. There's the stadium. There is the stadium. So you see you have one place for your field. And if you look, the middle row... Basically, that's all level one, and then you have the press box right above it, uh, right above the field. So you have level one for all of your different upgrade types. And then if you look at the other tiles, they have either two or three colors. And that tells you what upgrades you can build in those locations. So over the course of the game, you will be, and it's primarily in the hot stove phases when you're making improvements to the field, that's where you'll be placing your tiles. So your field, your stadium not only generates benefit from its field, but it also generates a lot of revenue, right? In, in media, which can also help with revenue. New York and Pittsburgh, and we got uh, some St. Louis and some Boston here, and the colors all... Of in that uh, disc theme, there, there's related there. These are in the right, yep, um, and aesthetically tied together. And you've got uh, Chicago I think, and Philadelphia, so all the major cities. And then we've got the individual looks like the worksheets here and the sequence. Yes, that so that's the that allows you that's the reference card. And so as you are playing the game, everybody has one of those and it allows you to see the flow of the game. That's what the sequence is taking you through. And then on the worksheet side, that's where you can compute your income and your expenses. So this is what I love about games like this is because you have everyone gets, you know, mm -hmm. you have to remember every single thing. It's like it's right there. I. I so wish that that is a, a thing that uh, uh, stats-based games might ad adopt, especially because the rules sometimes are written like engineering manuals, and it gets a little sure. tricky. There is, yeah. So that was that was a stretch reward. So if you want to play, for example, a seven-season game, that's probably going to be played over two sessions. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the legacy tracker is that you can capture the characteristics of your team and your financial status and then have that ready for the next time you play. It's very much kind of like a, a war gamer mentality because you've got that game set up and it stays there on the table and you're really into it. And here is. Yes. So that is the board where you are keeping track of the outside track is where you're keeping track of your victories over the course of a season. And you see on that board is where you also, uh, it'll tell you the victory points that you uh, earn, depending on how many wins you have. And then in the lower left, there is the victory point tracker. In the upper left, that's where you're keeping track of what year and what phase you are in. So there are two white discs that you track with that. In the upper right is the fan track. Fans are a source of revenue, maybe not surprisingly. And then the bottom middle where you see the regular season, there are season cards. So as you go through the course of the season, there are seven season cards because there are eight teams per league. You will play every team in the league even if they are not present at the table, they, they become a non-player team. And then in the lower right is the star player pool. 
And there's additional information that's actually on the board. So like if you need to hire a manager, the roles there, the results, et cetera. A lot of the information you need is in fact on the cards or on the board, et cetera. So it, it winds up, you don't have to go hunting very much. A lot of us worked very hard on the rule book and I was very pleased that I could go back and be like, yep, that's where I expect it to be. So <laughs> it was like, it kind of, I was, I was happy with the, with the results of that. Speaking of the rule book, 30 pages, special thank you to our Kickstarter backers and specifically Adam Tucker and Mike Petrillo for their rule book edits. Editing, very important. Being an editor myself and development, Jeff and Carla Horger, graphic art, Gavin Townsend, Brian Dalrymple, editing, Jennifer Jamelli and Keith Bloom, art, Nicole Balsley, design, Bob and Max Jamelli. I could have just showed that to you. What am I doing here? But uh keeping I appreciate your... you shouting everybody out. There was a splendid effort by everybody. And it's just uh there you go. It's uh how many iterations were there? Because it was quite a saga to get Lords of Baseball out of the gate, as I understand from Max. I don't know the exact number, but my expectation is that it actually there were so many iterations that it was probably more of a spectrum event rather than actual iterations because i think i think jeff and carla i believe it was in development maybe approaching 10 years they would know for certain and i expect somebody will comment on it at some point in time when they see this but it was extensive i know what max was describing is when he showed it to publishers early on there was interest. They thought that the idea was good, that there were some things there, but what they inevitably were seeing was it was just going to take too much work to round it into shape. They just, they didn't have the resources or time to make it happen. And when Jeff saw it, he, um, as I, I'm saying this by memory, but I, I think I'm capturing it correctly. He basically saw that there was enough there that, that it could be something special. And so really started to kind of dig in. Some things certainly got taken out, et cetera. I think it might have been three origins that I remember. The game was getting played in its... So I'm talking about like, you know, it was prior to COVID. When the game was getting played, there would be people standing around and watching. Like it, it was one of those kind of games. People were interested to start to to see that again. You know, it was exciting to see that with the finished product. Here we have the card sets. And let's see. Oh my goodness! Well, I don't, don't want to have them fall out here, but that's kind of what you're looking at there. Got yeah, and that's where you're looking at two of each one, right? Yeah, so that's. <laughs> Yes, that is the star player deck. The people who who backed at that level had a lot of fun with that. That's the regular season. Yeah, so that's the cost for your star players. And then the regular season cards have a particular event that helps you for that series. That's the franchise cards uh, as well as I expect a few. I think that also has the... Um, season bonus cards and a couple other things. So the franchise cards on the flip side, yeah, that's hot stove. Hot stove is the other side of that. So on the other side, that franchise card, the side you showed is thematic. On the other side are the character starting characteristics of the franchise. You're starting capital, uh, the makeup of your team and your, your front office, your manager, um, and your farm system. So that's, uh, that's what that tells you. And so there's variability within that throughout. Yes. Yep. Over here. So basically your Pittsburgh or Boston team could have very different uh, characteristics over. Yes. Yeah. And it's so that the, the fact that at one side of it says Pittsburgh is purely thematic. That was another thing that we kickstart. People could pay to be a quote franchise owner. And so the name of their choosing is on there. Uh, and I also offered for people to pick cities that were, you know, that are appearing in the game, but the card itself is not formally tied to a city. Those are dealt out. Of All right. Let's just walk through some of these. There's, uh... Oh, actually, there's uh, my Uncle Brian is the one that you now have on the top, the one right behind that one. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, there you go. 
yeah, that's that's my uncle Brian. That was the image from uh, from the boot hill. So cool, nice. Brilliant, brilliant. He yeah. makes his appearance, and then my son's in there as well. A number of the backers had their children in this. They asked if that was okay. I was like, absolutely, it's okay. Like this is part of the fun. I'm surprised there are no pets in there. Every once in a while, <laughs> <laughs> that one I think I would have probably put the put the kibosh. <laughs> There we go. That's the season bonus, and then the, that's the schedule card. So there are seven of those for each league that takes you through the different teams. Well, we're glad that it's gotten such great response. Certainly looking forward to even more availability for folks perhaps here as, a, as a, they get familiar with it, as it makes the rounds. That's the season bonus. So at the beginning of the season, there's a particular goal for that that year. So that is uh, single highest bleacher level. Over the course of that year, the, once, the, once the year wraps up after hot stove, the team that has the highest bleacher level will get anywhere between one and three victory points. In reverse order, right? It, it kind of resolves the runaway leader thing. Person in first would get one. If a person were in last, they would get three. The idea is that, that that reflects almost like a level of expectation, right? A team that isn't doing as well, but that has that kind of improvement, the bump would be higher. Whereas the champion from the year prior does that. It's like, you know, the collective reaction is like, well, yeah, of course. But I think it actually captures sentiment. I talked to Max about the fans and he was explaining that it, it's, it is fan expectation, not a not a static number of fans, right? And I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's why they kind of drift toward a center. That made very good sense. When I have asked questions, why is this the way it is? I have been happy with the answers I have got. That is not always the case when it comes to a game. Sure. sure. Well, that's the I have to qualify that because of like, of course it's not always the case in life, right? Sure. <laughs> Well, there are so many mechanics to choose from and so many le layers of depth that you can tell a story that you have to make, you know, it's always that balance of function, mm -hmm. features, and playability. So, Yeah, it throws people off. There are times that we have received bad reviews, and you can go and look them up. And it's because people, like, well, I won the World Series and didn't win the game. It's like, and, and as mentioned, this is about the business of baseball. Like, you know, you have to, yes, winning the World Series matters because it suggests that you did well in the season and therefore you got some more victory points for that. But if if the person behind you was one, you know, one victory less, the World Series victory gets you a victory point. But if that person who was one victory behind you in the regular season, but they did a better job building out their stadium, something like that, then when that starts to kind of be resolved, then they may very well have more victory points than you do. As I was getting to play it more during Origins and kind of looking at it and trying to process some things, what I was realizing is you need to try to create separation so that you actually are like, so if you're going to, if you're going to the World Series, you want to lap the competition kind of thing. Right, you want to be way out to just kind of squeak in. That's going to be a tough fight because you're going to have to take two retirement tokens because you were in first, and those tend to be pretty punitive. And other people will have probably been doing things, you know, focused in slightly different directions, and so you won't be a leader in that. So you, you right, you can't be a leader in everything, barring something shocking. It's just not really the way it's going to unfold. That's where realizing that that is not, you know, that's cool and it's nice bragging rights, but, but that doesn't mean that you have an insurmountable lead because you did that. That is far from the case. Keith, thank you so much for walking us through this, this deluxe edition. It's really amazing. Are there any other games in your pipeline besides uh, Lords of Baseball that you can share that are, are on the on tap for L4 Studios. I do a lot of work with Lab H. We're making splendid progress on the Dark Domains expansion, Lotus District. When I say splendid progress, precisely the artwork is coming along very nicely. So 
Um, once we get that all wrapped up, we will then be transitioning to the graphics side and getting those files off to the factory. So I'm excited about that. Lab H has a lot of games that are developed and, and ready. There are others, but uh, we'll we'll save that for another call. What I, I I think I think based on the response, like I said, my expectation is to have a Kickstarter landing page up and ready for the expansion. I envision that possibly, like in a perfect world, probably would have that start up around the World Series. I want to see the feedback we get at Gen Con and such, but my expectation is to have the page up with a QR code, et cetera, so that when that is at Gen Con, people can, if they're interested, they can they can follow it that way. There are two games, well, there are many games that are done, but there are two in that uh, we're looking at specifically. One of them is uh, Richard Berg, B-E-R-G design, that we're excited about, that I've had for a while. So uh, some of your... your uh, your followers who are kind of some of the old school designers, that one, that one would be a neat one. So I'm excited to see that one make its way to the, to the table as well. When is Gen Con? Where is it? And uh, it's a huge show and how will folks find you there? What will you be showing them? Gen Con is in Indianapolis. It is the first weekend of August uh, to where I actually believe that Thursday might even be end of July. Um, so I think it's like the 31st to the 3rd, if memory serves. But, you know, it's it's that early in August. And I will be at the uh, Mayfair booth. So L4 Studios will be displaying within that um, because Mayfair and Mr. B Games, they, uh, they are working together. So you'll see them in hand. So I will be in that booth. I will have uh, Lords of Baseball there. Lords of there are events for Lords of Baseball and Dark Domains at the show. Both of them are sold out. Um, however, I also I, I like to leave a couple spaces open so that if somebody comes up with you know family or whatever, that there's a couple spaces. So uh, definitely stop by. You can see the game hill. That's in the schedule. But then we'll also I will have the game then also at the booth. Like I was mentioning, kind of in a smaller presentation mode, the show and whatnot. And and it'll be available for purchase there. We did do the you got the the player expansions, the the two two player expansions that expand the base game from four to eight. We are very, very low on them. And what we are currently doing is making sure that everybody who purchased those on Kickstarter has received them in good order. And then what we have left, we're going to have at Gen Con and then also put on the Mr. Beacon. We've been asked about that a lot. So with in tandem with the Kickstarter, those would also be reprinted. But I expect that we have a few left, but we just wanted to be um, conservative and make sure everybody got what they were supposed to. But those who have been looking for it, um, it'll it'll be worth checking, stopping by the booth at, at Gen Con as well. Check it out, folks. Keep your eyes on L4 Studios and the hope for a second reprint of Lords of Baseball. Exercise your Euro game muscle side by side with your favorite stats-based games. Keith, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time.